Gnosticism. Gnosticism was the earliest heresy in the church. Gnosticism is a system of thought that teaches that which is spiritual is spiritual, that which is physical or material is material, and never the twain shall meet. And so a Gnostic version of Jesus would be something like this. Jesus was fully human except for his mind. He had the mind of the God. And because he had the mind of God, he knew things. And because he knew things, he could do anything. Where did his power come from? Here, God's mind. Now, some in the early church realized that's problematic. Because if we follow that train of thinking, that means Jesus' mind wasn't human. And so he could save all of us except for our mind. This kind of thinking, and the heresy is technically known as Apollinarism, this kind of thinking permeates the church. We in Protestantism have so turned Jesus into a demigod, into something other than human, so that he really can't save us. And as a result, we start breaking salvation down into component parts. So, well, I'll pray the prayer and I'll get saved and I'll go to heaven. Um, or uh, I will follow all these laws and I'll go to heaven. But w what we don't do is we don't allow the human Jesus who experiences human reality to be the one that then shows us how to transform our human reality. That's presupposition number one, the problem of Christian idolatry, making Jesus into something he's not. Now, liberalism has its own set of problems. Christian progressive Christian liberalism uh, says Jesus is not divine. He is just not God, you know, he's just a human being. He's a nice man. He's a good man. He's a prophet. He's a teacher. But he's certainly not God. And when you say that, now you've disconnected God, the spiritual, from Jesus the man. There's that dualism. Comes from Plato. Influences Gnosticism. Once you do that, Jesus can't save you. And that's why in the progressive liberal tradition, when you go to church on Easter Sunday, Easter's a symbol. It's spring after winter. You know, it's, and we do, we do this nonsense, you know. So the problem of Christian idolatry didn't just exist in the community of First John. It permeates Christianity. It's been an issue since the first century. The Apostle Paul has to argue against this kind of thinking in the letter to the Colossians. <clears throat> now there is a book written by a Canadian Presbyterian, uh, Philip Lee, called Against the Protestant Gnostics. And that's a play on a title of the ancient heresiologist Irenaeus in the late second century who wrote a book against heresies. Philip Lee contends that if you trace American Protestantism back to its roots and then follow it forward, whether you're conservative, like the Puritan tradition, or whether you're liberal, like the congregational tradition, and we're talking back in New England in the you know, 16, 1700s, it really didn't matter. What both camps were doing was they were both arguing on the level of presuppositions. The, that is, what are the things that you need to believe before you start building a theological model? And these presuppositions were fundamentally Gnostic. So you had the conservatives, and you had the liberals both going, we have the true right to be Gnostics, yes. you see? And that's a, that's a, uh, a straw man. It, it's, a, it's a false paradigm. Because no matter how you slice it or dice it, Jesus, you cannot say that Jesus is both divine and human, and that the human is saved fully and completely. And that leads me to point number three. <clears throat> now, Point number three is what we call sacrificial hermeneutics. This is where we read the story of Jesus and we read it through the lens of our cultural Western tradition so that Jesus becomes a sacrifice to the deity, whether it's 
the Roman gods, the Greek gods, the Mayan gods, the Assyrian gods, the Babylonian gods, all cultures, when it comes to divinity, presuppose sacrifice. All religion uses sacrifice. And when you have a sacrificial god, when you have a god that requires blood or life, that god is presented, at least in the Christian tradition, as two-faced. You remember uh, Tommy Lee Jones playing in the Batman movie, the two-faced character. That is the Christian god. This god can be happy. This god can be angry. And so what you end up with is a god that when you pray, you hope that god has not been drinking. Okay? You really, really, this is, think about this now. How many times when you've prayed, do, are you concerned that God might be angry at you? That God might, might um, seek to um, correct your life? Okay? The God of grace becomes the God of law. The God of mercy becomes the God of wrath. This God is two-faced. There is at that point, another marker of this dualism between spirit and matter, divine and human, so that in order to bridge the gap, we have to turn Jesus into a sacrifice. Now, this happened early, early in the early church, very, very early, and we find it even in the New Testament. Um, what did I just say? We find yes. sacrificial thinking yes. in the New Testament. It's writ large in the Jewish scriptures. There's all manner of stuff about sacrifice to, the God, to God in the Jewish scriptures. In the New Testament, we find the same logic in certain writers. Okay, And this presents the real problem because there are some writers in the New Testament that are oriented toward this sacrificial way of thinking. And then there's Paul, the Gospel of Mark, the writer of Luke and Acts, the writer of the fourth Gospel and the little letters that are non-sacrificial. On the other hand, there are texts in the New Testament where um, Jesus is, through this sacrificial reading, turned back into a wrathful God. The Gospel of Matthew is the big one. Now, what do I mean by this? If you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you're comparing the texts, you'll notice that there's very little a reference to the wrath of God at the end of time in Mark, Luke, John, or Paul. There is, however, a tremendous amount of it in Matthew. That is, Matthew's Jewish community in and around Antioch sometime in the 80s is framing, taking this Jesus tradition, and they're going to take it right back into the Jewish theology of the time. We call it Second Temple Jewish thinking. And that thinking presupposes an angry God at the end of time. So if you've got an angry God at the end of time, and you've got a gracious Jesus here in his ministry, you still have a, a Janus-faced God, a two-faced God. And the dispensationalists do this. They say, well, you know, Jesus came and he brought grace and Israel rejected it. And so he founded the church and he'll come back at the end of time. And you say to, to the dispensationalist, well, have you ever considered following Jesus teaching? And they go, oh, no, that was just for Israel. And they're able to sacrifice Jesus teaching. And then they're able to use that sacrificial approach to justify all manner of God's violence and our violence. So that's the third presupposition, sacrificial hermeneutics. That leads me to the fourth presupposition. There is a fundamental distinction to be made between faith and trust. When we come to a text like, we are justified by faith. Now what is faith? What do you think faith is? What is faith? For evangelicals and for liberals in the Protestant tradition, faith is certainty about knowledge. That is, I know these things to be true. I've figured them out. I've sorted them out. And I believe those propositions. That's faith. In other words, faith is 
a component of reason. Okay, you with me so far? Now, the Greek term pistis, which is the term that's used in the New Testament, if you take this term pistis and you do what Teresa Morgan did with it in her big fat book on faith, and she just analyzes the whole thing linguistically for like 400 pages, she shows that when you translate pistis into the Latin term fides, remember the Bible gets translated into Latin by Jerome in the 400s, and it, that is the translation for the Western church. When you do that, fides is a component of reason. But if you take Paul, and uh, I'm sorry, if you take pistis, and you look at the way pistis is used both in the New Testament as well as other Greek literature, what you find is pistis needs to be translated as trust. Now, trust is something we all do all the time. I just met you, Shane. You trust me. I trust you. Until one of us breaks that trust, correct? Now, the trust is automatic. You're, you all have money. Your U.S. dollar fiat currency. What makes it work? What makes it work is your trust in the system that prints those dollars. But when you lose trust in the system, you will lose faith in the currency. And you're about to see that over the next five years because all fiat currencies are now going to collapse. And we're moving into a new economic, global economic system, cryptocurrencies. Okay. And that's why we have a war right now. Whenever there is a currency shift, World War I, next currency, sh and that, that we started the central banking system, World War II, Bretton Woods. 1971, Nixon takes us off the gold standard, Vietnam. And now today, we're in the midst of a massive uh, shift in our currency, and we're, what are we facing right now? The possibility of global war, okay? so. All these things are, are built around trust. We, we extend trust. It's a natural phenomenon for us to extend trust when we meet somebody until they do something to break that trust. But trust is a human phenomenon. It's no surprise then that that one thing that we are constantly engaged in without even thinking about it becomes the basis for the gospel. What is it we are doing when we say, um, I am justified by trust? Okay, If I say I'm justified by faith, that means I'm justified because I believe these certain doctrines, and now I'm justified. And if you don't ha have the same agreement with me on those doctrines, you don't have faith. We do not have faith in doctrine. Followers of Jesus trust the Father. Followers of Jesus trust the Son. Followers of Jesus trust the Spirit. We don't have to have this set of intellectual propositions that we've decided to sit down and all agree to. Those are the things we can dialogue over. But what it is that unites us as brothers and sisters in this business of the reign of God is that no matter where we're at in life, no matter who we are, no matter what we're undergoing, we are all learning to trust. Yes, sir. Yes, okay? Yes, so that's the distinction I want to make between faith and trust. <clears throat> My fifth proposition or, or thesis is that the passion of Jesus is an epistemic ground. What is epistemic? Epistemic means, how do you know what you know? How do you know what you know? You know that you know, but how do you know what you know? And this is science. What is science doing? Trying to determine how we can know what is real. You with me so far? Okay. Now, when you come to the passion of Jesus, what you're going to find is this. You move through a story, and it's a trial, like all trials. And when you read that story, and if you've read the gospel before that, you recognize that Jesus is getting framed. Mm 
sure. And he's going to go before a kangaroo court. For sure. And he's going to be prosecuted with lies. He's going to be tortured. And then he's going to be executed as a criminal. You with me so yeah, far? Absolutely. Now, what happens in the Passion? What is it that's going on to, that really changes things? Why does Paul say, we preach Christ crucified? What is he saying? We believe Jesus was sacrificed to God so he could just uh, make sure that God was a vampire and got all the blood he needed? That's conservative evangelicalism. They have a vampiric God. No. When you read the Passion of Jesus, you see the same story that we see coming out of Russia right now. People that are being arrested, tried on false charges, convicted, and sent to the gulag. We also have it in the United States. How many African-American men have been set up in the same way? Okay? Now, this is global, but it's not simply global. It's not just um, synchronic, that is, it's not just everywhere, but it also goes back through history. You can trace it going back to the Puritans and the witch hunts. Yes. Correct? You can go into the Middle Ages and the persecution of the Jews who brought the plague. So you could take it into ancient mythology. Why was Thebes uh, sent a plague? Because Oedipus had committed a sin. Okay? So the passion narrative is telling the same story that happens all through human history, everywhere. It's connecting us to our reality both in space and in time. What is going on at the cross? So think through the passion story. Gethsemane, the arrest, the trial before Herod, the trial before Pilate, the Via Dolorosa, the walking to Calvary, carrying the cross, the crucifixion, the death of Jesus. Is there a single mention of God the Father, or just God in general, in the Passion narrative? No. Is there any mention of God? No. Just like there wouldn't be in, a, in an African-American male's trial or a, a Russian protester's trial. There's no need to mention God. Why? Is God absent? How many of you have seen pictures or portraits in museums of Calvary? And what do you have? You have three crosses, couple of men and women, Roman soldiers, some Pharisees and others. Do you have God? Is God there? Is God there? When you look, just when you look at the text, no. there is no God. There is no God. What the passion is doing is undercutting any belief that we have that God is a Superman God. It's undercutting any way of thinking that says God is what's known as a deus ex machina. And a deus ex machina is Latin for God from a basket or a machine. So in the ancient Greek dramas, you had the stage and the back of the stage and then, of course, backstage. And the players are doing the drama on stage, one of Sophocles' plays, for example. And there's a, one of the gods, like Zeus or Apollo, has to enter the stage. But you don't want a god to enter the stage from the side wings, like all the human actors do. So you lower the god from a basket at the back of the stage. That's how you show this Superman god character that comes down and saves the day. At the cross, there is no deus ex machina. There is no Superman god. There is no delivering god. There is no liberating God. Nothing stopped Jesus from dying. The cross ends theological thinking. The cross says anything you think you know about God is done. The cross erases all of your theology and forces you into a new place a new episteme, a new ground, a new orientation. Now, how is it that the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians could say, God was in Christ reconciling the world to God's self by not counting their trespasses against them? How did Paul see that? How, I mean, 
Paul walked into a museum today and looked at one of those pictures or read the passion narrative. How, how is it that Paul could say at this event, wow. at, at the, at, 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 of ultimate degradation, violence, bloodshed, human sacrifice, how is it that Paul could say God was right there doing God's very best work reconciling the world to God's self. It's because Paul recognized that when he encountered Jesus, all of his views of God got canceled. Yes. See, God's not into cancel culture except for our theology. Okay? But what, what, what the work of the Spirit is, is all about, first of all, is to cancel our theological thinking. Okay? Because our theological thinking is an idol. All the stuff we've learned in church. All the stuff in the history of Christendom. Not all of it, but the vast majority of it is idolatry. This is one of the problems of being a theologian. Um, what, you're, what, what, what theologians, they, they go to school and they think, gosh, I'm going to um, get my PhD, I'm going to go teach in a university or a seminary, and I'm just going to present jewel and gem after jewel or gem, right? Um, what they don't tell the theologians is, hey, you see that junkyard over there? All those mounds and mounds and miles of junk? There's a diamond in there somewhere. <laughs> and the poor theologian spends their life sorting through trash to find that diamond. Michael, dare I ask you to give the one-liner about the God concept? At yeah. So in my book, Knowing God, um, I wrote, at Calvary, God concepts die. All God concepts die. Christians have yet to stand before the cross and allow their God concepts to die. They... they they're so afraid. They've been told if you, if you lose your faith, um, there's something wrong with you. And, and yet it's absolutely your faith that needs to get lost. <laughs> because you have to trust. You have to see with eyes that you don't normally see with. You have to be able to look at this dying human criminal figure and say, God is doing something right here. What exactly is it God is doing? Well, we know from the text very, very clearly what God is doing. Jesus says over and over and over again, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And it's the only saying of the seven sayings on the cross that gets repeated. The Greek verb there is an iterative imperfect, over and over and over. So he talks to the thief on the cross. He says, I'm thirsty, one time. Uh, he quotes one of the Psalms one time. He turns around and um, says, Father, into your hands I forgive my spirit, one time. But for six hours, his only prayer is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So the cross breaks ground. It breaks the ground under, that we thought we had that was solid and shows us that's quicksand. And then it sets us in another place. It, 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 in a sense, it's a, an intellectual cleansing. Okay? Um, kind of like an intellectual colon cleanse, I guess, you know? Um, but that's what the passion does. That's what the gospel does. As Luther would put it, the gospel wounds and it heals. But it has to wound first, okay? Um, it has to show us that we've been looking at this thing through a lens that's been girded, undergirded by Gnostic thinking and sacrificial hermeneutics. And as a result, we end up creating a Jesus when we do that that is different than the Father, it's the Father, you know, the Father's in heaven, and the Father's the lawgiver, and the Father's the judge, jury, and executioner, and the Father is more like Satan, okay? And Jesus is the nice guy, um, and so um, the Father and the Son play police, 
and um, you get arrested for breaking God's commandments. You're put into the interrogation room, and Jesus comes in and says, hey, look, I'm the good cop. My father's the bad cop. You're going to have to take one of us. So if you'll believe in me, he won't get pissed at you. Okay? And what do we have here? A Janus-faced God. A son who is not like the father. And a father who's not like the son. Okay? <clears throat> That's number five. Number six. What is the Christian, or I might, might I dare say, the, um, the approach that's given to us in the gospel. What's the gospel perspective? So we've established that there is a problem of idolatry in the church. It is Gnostic in character, and I'm only dealing with Protestantism here, but we could do the same thing with Catholicism, Orthodoxy, Anabaptism, okay? We've established that there are these sacrificial hermeneutics. There's this way of thinking that mixes Grace and law mixes mercy and wrath, mixes love and hate. Okay, we've established that. We've talked about the distinction between faith as an intellectual operation versus trust. Okay, and then the rendering of all of this as null and void in the cross. So where, where does that leave us? Does that leave us with atheism? In a technical sense, yes, it does. Christians, true followers of Jesus, are atheists. What do I mean by that? When I'm asked, do you believe in God? I say, no, I don't need to believe in God. I trust the Father. I don't have a God concept. I don't need a God concept. I don't need something from philosophy or history or Christian theology that I then have to take my work and, and, and pack it into. No. What I need to do is learn that in the gospel, trust in the gospel is trust that we are loved by the Father. End of story, period, end of sentence, close the damn book. Amen. That's yes. it. Yes. We trust that our Father loves us. We trust that circumstances are not a barometer of the Father's love, right? Right. right? So it's right. So so trust means that we've rejected this two-faced God, and rightly so, because that God is not worthy of our worship. Okay? Trust tr believes the message that God so loved the world that he loved you and you and you and you and you. He loved all of us. He loved the Russians. He loved the Ukrainians. He loved the U.S. He loves the Brits. Kind of loves the Germans. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, he loves everybody. Right? Okay. Now, I'm not saying this leaves us with a wishy-washy Santa Claus God that doesn't really give it. Uh, uh, That's okay. Um, um, uh, a hoot, a hoot. Um, <laughs> Fred, y'all should be here. <laughs> I, I, that train left the station. <laughs> okay, all right. Next train. Here we go. We, we've learned that, that trust, it, 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 it's not easy. Because we've been taught to look at our life and ask whether God's blessing us or whether God is against us. Is God for me? Oh, he must be. I just got that job. I got the new car. I got, you know, um, my health is good. I've got money. I'm, I am blessed. And then the regular person, the 99% that are struggling through life, they're doing the Psalms. Where are you, Lord? Why do the wicked prosper? I'm doing the best I can. Why, why aren't you with me? Because, the, of course, the reason that they think that is because the church has taught them this. And they're waiting for that Superman God to come in and save the day. <clears throat> Rather than recognizing that life has no, that the circumstances, I should say, have nothing to do with the Father. Amen. Nothing. Whether you're 
Healthy as an athlete or you've got cancer. Whether you are African American, Latino, Latina, um, white, and white people count in God's reign and so do white males, and I know you politically correct people out there are gonna get pissed, but too bad. For God so loved the world. I'm gonna do an aside here. Several years back, um, I had a, an activist, an ethnic activist, um, quote Luke Fort uh, on Facebook to me. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor, um, recovery of sight to the blind, liberation for the captive, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and the acceptable year of our Lord. And she hashtagged it, not for white males. Whoa, thank you so and I much. kind of came at that and had to say, no, that can't be the case. Because yeah. the moment you have the right to exclude white males, then in my theological system, I can start excluding other ethnic groups as well. And there was a big row about this, you know. But the reality is, we are, are those who learn this business of trust. And it's not easy. It's a process. It's a discipline. It's a... Uh, it's like learning to cook, learning to play violin, learning to ride a bike, learning to read. It's to trust that the Father loves us and to not look at circumstances as a barometer of the Father's love is to begin at the cross. Because when Jesus is dying, he, he never once says, why? Where are you? Why, did you? why did you abandon me? And you're going to go, but Michael, didn't he quote Psalm 22? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And they go, oh, Jesus felt abandoned by God. Why did he feel abandoned by God? Oh, because God had made him sin and God can't stand sin. Because God's poured his wrath out on him. And what they fail to do at that point is reckon with the fact that on the cross, it is virtually impossible to breathe. In order to breathe in, you have to push up on your feet and on the little piece of wood they put underneath your genitals and butt. You have to push up on it to inhale, and you've got to let down on it so the nails or ropes on, are pulling on your arms this way. Okay? Cross death is a slow death. It normally took days. The body to get to the place it could no longer pull itself up, and you suffocated. Crucifixion is death by suffocation. Okay? You never have Jesus once say, why have you abandoned me, as though he actually felt abandoned by the Father, because Psalm 22 is a scapegoat psalm. Psalm 22 tells the story of a person whose community is turned on him. Yeah. Psalm 22 is about a figure that can't, can't figure out what's going on, because they didn't do anything to deserve the wrath of the community. And at the end of that psalm, the psalmist does not say, Dear God, come and destroy my enemies. There's no violence there, no what we would call eschatological need for vengeance. Instead, that very psalm says, Vindicate me. Somehow show these people that this act that they're committing is a false act. It's wrong. Okay? So um, we, we are those who trust, just like Jesus did, so that we can say, even in the most intense suffering, at the end, Papa, into your hands I commit my spirit. In other words, this thing that I call life that I've lived, I can't give meaning to. So I'm going to give this life to you and let you give it meaning. And boy, did the Spirit bring Jesus out of the tomb. Did the Spirit take the church and bring this message so that today, 2,000 years later, there's not a person on the planet who doesn't know who Jesus is. He's been vindicated. There's nobody, very, with rare exceptions, rare exceptions in the scholarly world, there's nobody out there that's going to look at the passion narrative and say, yeah, Jesus was guilty. He's innocent. He's absolutely innocent. He's framed. Okay? Now, when you look at the gospel that way, when you look at the passion narrative that way, you have removed 
all of the mythological thinking, all of the penal substitutionary atonement nonsense, you've, you've just simply wiped that away. It doesn't exist because the father of Jesus is not two-faced. The father is like the son. Jesus is not two-faced. The spirit is like the son and the father. The spirit is not two-faced. As an aside, in the charismatic tradition, the spirit is two-faced. Because in the charismatic tradition, when you go to the churches, the Holy Spirit always says good things about the church, prophesying about the church, God loves us, God's with us, God's blessed us, but God, God hates the world, God hates the gays, God hates this, God, you know, that's a genus faced spirit. That's the spirit of idolatry. <clears throat> if we learn through life, and it isn't easy, to trust the Father through thick and thin, through, in a sense, in sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer, okay? When we trust the Father that way, then we don't try and put our lives into a, a place where um, we spend our whole existence trying to figure out how to please God. God is not displeased with us. God loves us. Now, this does not mean that there aren't things that we do that don't, uh, and I'm going to be anthropomorphic here, wound God. But what it does suggest is that this father who sends this son to expose what we are doing as human beings with each other, as human community, human society, human culture, that gets exposed. And once it's exposed, then the resurrection, of course, reverses everything, and we now have the distinction between revelation and religion. Okay? That is to trust in the Father. It's the hardest thing there is to do. Believe you me, it is hard. Because whenever something happens in my life that is not fun, first thing I do is, okay, now what did I do? What did I do? And why is this happening to me? Instead of recognizing that life is life. Yes. Things are just going to happen. Mm -hmm. I have no control over life. I don't even have control over my life. Right? I don't know if I've got a tumor in my brain right now that's going to explode. Right? I don't know if my ticker's going to stop tonight. I don't know if my daughter's going to get in a car accident or my granddaughters are you know, going to get hurt. I, I, I can't control that. But what I can control is, is that I will continue trusting no matter what, no matter how it gets. And this leads us into non-sacrificial thinking. It forces us to recognize that God doesn't want sacrifice. Listen to me. God does not want sacrifice. And you say to yourself, wait a minute. In the Jewish scriptures, there's all this sacrifice stuff. There's Abraham and Isaac. There's the book of Leviticus, man. There's David with the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle and sacrifices of bulls and rams and then Solomon builds this temple and now we've got all these sacrificial rituals going on and by the time we get to Herod's great temple in the time of Jesus, this sacrificial thing is going on right and left. I find it intriguing that Jesus dies at the exact same time, the Passover lambs are being slaughtered in the temple for the Passover meal later that night. In the Gospel of John, chapter 18, uh, this is the writer's um, approach. That is, what we don't recognize, what Jesus' contemporaries could not recognize, is that they're practicing sacrifice in the temple, but they don't see themselves as practicing sacrifice when they execute him. Okay, They're, that's justice. Okay, that's justice. Temple, sacrifice. Cross, justice. And as a result, 
in their own lives and in the, in the Christian sphere, most Christians today will do their penal substitutionary thing, God's pouring his wrath out on Jesus, and that gives us the right to pour our wrath out, as, as Christians, to pour our wrath out on non-Christians. And there you have the whole history of colonization, the West conquering territory after territory, slaughtering people right and left in the name of Jesus, the pacifist, the peacekeeper, right? That's just absurd. There is a non-sacrificial way of thinking. And it goes like this. This is a text from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 10. And what we're going to begin in chapter 9, and I'm going to read you a very simple text. If I can find it. Okay. In a description in Hebrews, which is all about the tabernacle, not the temple, but the tabernacle, the writer says, When every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses, to all the people he took the blood of calves and the blood of goats, with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. How many of you have heard that text quoted? Okay. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Jesus had to die. God sent Jesus to die. That's what God wanted. The Father wanted the Son to die. Why? Because the Father was getting so full of anger, so full of hatred for the human race, that something had to be done to stop that process. So the Father says, I'm going to send you, and... I'm going to pour my wrath out on you, and I'm going to take your blood, and that'll just make me feel so much better. That's nothing more than divine child abuse. However, this is what the writer will say a few moments later. So for those that are arguing, those that say to you, you have to have Jesus die. God wanted Jesus to die. He needed Jesus to die. Here's what the writer says a few verses later. When Christ came into the world, he said, yeah. now who's he talking to? When Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and in sin offerings, you take no pleasure. And then I said, I have come to do thy will, O God, as it is written of me in the book. Now, who is the Son, Jesus, talking to Come in on, the text? Now, yeah. Well, it's help the Father. Yeah. Okay? When Christ gets ready to come into the world, the Father and the Son are having a good time watching the New York Giants beat Dallas. They're eating their pizza, drinking beer. You know, Everything is pretty good. And the Father says, you know, I think it's time for you to kind of pop off and go down into the womb of the Virgin Mary because I need you to die can't stand this human species. I can't stand them. I need a sacrifice. That logic is completely blown away by this text right here. When Christ came into the world, he says, he turns to the Father, I know you don't want sacrifice. Hallelujah. I know you don't want that. Now watch this. This is even better. After he says, I have come to do thy will, O God, as it is written me in the roll of the book, the writer of Hebrews, and this is the only time in the New Testament a writer is going to give you the reason they are actually citing a biblical wow. text. Wow. Okay? Normally they just cite it. It is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. Here the writer is going to tell you, I'm going to show you why I've quoted this verse. So, he says, 
When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, he puts a parenthesis. These are offered according to the law. And he abolishes sacrifice. Whoa! This is huge. This is absolutely huge. It says very, very clearly that the God who makes the heavens and the earth, the God who is part of the whole process of, of evolution, the, the, the human project from beginning to end, whether you believe in a literal six-day creation or evolution, I just, I don't care. If God is part of this process, and, and God's being part of that process means God does not require blood. God is not a vampire. Okay? Our modern cultural fascination with vampires, particularly in the 90s and in the, yes, since yeah. the turn of the millennium, is simply a cultural reaction to an analogy with this Christian God tradition. Okay? And that's why at first you had Dracula. Now Dracula comes at night and he bites your neck and sucks your blood and turns you into a vampress, right? That's Dracula. And then you get interview with the vampire. Yeah. And the vampire, you know, he's kind of good, kind of not so good. And now we have all these Netflix series about the good vampires. Yes. Okay? <laughs> See, we as human beings really, really struggle with this business of blood. Is this the way the other world is wow. or not? Wow. And so we're seeing it shown culturally in film and books. Uh, and um, yeah, non-sacrificial hermeneutics means that when we read scripture, we're going to read it through a different lens than that which the church has given us. We're going to read it through the lens of the gospel. We're going to read it through the lens of the father-son relationship. When we read the gospel or the Hebrew scriptures through the relationship, father-son relationship, and we're willing to acknowledge there is no difference, no distinction between the father and the son. When we do that, we are not dividing God's attributes up. Well, the Father has the attributes of justice and wrath and judgment, and the Son has the attributes of um, mercy and grace and kindness, and the Spirit just has spooky attributes. <laughs> Makes you do strange things like, you know. Okay. When we affirm there's no distinction between the Father and the Son, we are making a theological statement yes, that cannot be undercut. But the church has spent its entire existence dividing up God into a person of the Father, a person of the Son, a person of the Spirit. We do this metaphysically. We do it in terms of God's attributes. We do it temporally. Father in the Old Testament, Jesus yeah. in the Gospels, the Spirit in the age of the church. Yeah. We, we divvy up God into pieces. A non-sacrificial hermeneutic is always going to lead us to one conclusion. There is one God named as Father, Son, and Spirit. And they are identical. How do you know the Father? You only know the Father because you see the Son. How do you know the Son? You only know the Son because the Spirit has come to you and shown you the Son. How does this work? Jesus empties himself. Who, being in the form of a servant, did not consider equality with God to consist in the act of grasping, but in emptying himself, took the form of a servant, became a human being, died across death. Right? Jesus empties himself so that in his lifetime, he does not live his life. His life is not about what he wants. His life is not about his choices. The only choice he has from his perspective is to just let the Father be revealed in him, whatever that may mean. 
however it may come about. So much so that by the end of his life, he can look and say, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay, and that's enough. So how does this relate to the work of the Spirit? When the Father sends the Spirit to us, the Spirit empties herself, and Jesus fills her. And that's why Jesus will say, when I send the Spirit to you, she will teach you everything about me. That's why we are Jesus-focused in our worship and prayer, because the Spirit has emptied herself to show us Jesus, who's emptied himself to show us the Father. We now participate in the life of the Trinity. Now I'll ask you this, who sees the Spirit? When the body of Christ empties herself, wow. then the world sees the that Spirit. So you see this? Okay. So the, the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity, is not something we believe in. The doctrine of the Trinity is that by which we believe or trust through. Wow. It's not a doctrine. It's not something you can propositionally lay out and go, yeah, I believe that. No. When we are filled with the Spirit... Our minds are going to be turned to Jesus. And when that happens, Jesus turns us to the Father. And then the Father turns around and shares his glory with Jesus, the Son, who turns around and shares that glory with the Spirit. That is, the so-called persons of the Trinity are so interconnected, so singular, that it's actually possible to talk about three in terms of one. So the doctrine of the Trinity is not something we believe in, it's something we believe through. The, the doctrine of the Trinity is our reading lenses, our seeing lenses. We, we look at life through the Trinity. And here's the problem, the church has turned the Trinity into a doctrine or a dogma. Do you believe in the Trinity? And so the Muslims look at the Christians and they go, you're not monotheists. You got three gods, and the Muslims are right. Yeah. Because Christianity has so separated the Father and the Son and the Spirit that we have three gods. We just hope Jesus is the biggest one of them. <laughs> right? So the Trinity is our hermeneutic. The Trinity is the gospel. God is the gospel. The gospel is not an abstract message. The gospel is not a series of propositions. The gospel is our encounter with this living reality that the world would call a God concept. But we learn to see everything through. And thus we participate in the life of this father-son-spirit relationship that we will call God. That leads me to my last, the solution for Gnosticism, the solution for sacrificial thinking, the solution to our idolatry, the solution to our inability to trust because we need certainty, we need an intellectual operation that's going to make so that we know why we believe. So we create theories of inspiration. Oh, God wrote the word, God wrote the word. And we got a theory of inspiration. All scripture is inspired by God. And just, so God wrote everything in it. And that means we got to put it all together like a giant two million piece jigsaw puzzle with no box cover. Okay, and that's our certainty. God wrote the book. This is the problem of Gnosticism. Certainty, I should say, the quest for certainty is the biggest lie of the church. The quest for certainty is a deception. Can I be certain you're not going to beat me up on the way out of here? I'll leave it to me. <laughs> That's why I locked the bedroom door. 
Well, yeah, the liquor is what is good. So, so certainty, the need to have, oh, I know why I believe this. I'm certain of this, just creates cognitive dissonance. Yes. It, it creates distortions. And we take that, this need for certainty into our theology, and now we have to begin justifying all this nonsense doctrine that we produce. Because we have to be certain. Certainty is an illusion. Michael, might I interject just for, Yeah. Could you make a comment just about weaponizing certainty? Okay. How, how, how our certainty then becomes weaponized against others? Can we do that at Q&A? Because okay. I'm not sure where you're going. Okay. okay. What is the solution to all of this? The solution is found in the teaching of Jesus in a very simple phrase. Follow me. Follow me. What does Jesus mean when he says, follow me? What does that mean? Well, gosh, you know, I mean, you look at all of Jesus' teaching and you're going, that's not realistic. Yeah. Turn the other cheek. Yeah. Pray for those that persecute you. Bless those that hate you. Oh, I know, I'm a dispensationalist. That's just meant for Israel. <laughs> to, today, today, in the name of Jesus, we can go to war and beat somebody up. Because that was then, this is now. When Jesus says, follow me, what's he asking us to do? He's asking us to walk a path. And walking that path is not something that's learned overnight. Okay? We start out as babies. We don't start out as marathoners. We start out learning little bits at a time how to turn the other cheek. Because believe you me, when somebody looks at you and starts telling you what a blankety blank 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 you are, what's our first tendency? Is to come right back at them. Bam! You know? And, and we have to learn what it means to offer a blessing. And then we have to learn what it means to offer a blessing with sincere intent. Because I know for me, the first time I'm on this path, I'm going, oh God, you know, Jesus, dear Jesus, please bless that asshole. It's, oops, sorry. Please, please bless that fool. Bless that fool. And I'm, but I'm not meaning it, but I'm trying. I'm learning to crawl. And then eventually I'll stand up on two feet and I'll go, Lord, bless that, you know. And, and, but then after a while I learned to walk. Then I learned to run. And then eventually I can run marathons. It becomes a lifestyle. A lifestyle of forgiving the enemy. And I get a kick out of Christians who, whenever I talk about forgiveness, they go, oh, I can't forgive. This person is bad. They're evil. They're wicked. They did this to me, and it hurts so bad I can't forgive them. And I say to myself, and you call yourself a Christian? You have yet to begin walking the path. You're just a baby. It takes practice. The Sermon on the Mount, bless those that persecute you, pray for those that spitefully use you, you know, turn the other cheek, all that stuff, is not law. Yeah, come on. It is how to practice a discipline. It's like karate. You start out as a white belt, and then you move through the belts as you learn the skill work. And the better you get at a skill, and, the, and then you pass that test, and then you move on to the next belt. And do you know what happens when you become a black belt? What does the mentor say? Start all over. Mm. Think about football. How many times, if you're a football fan, baseball fan, basketball fan, doesn't matter, sports. Think about sports. When a new coach comes onto a team, because the team has been doing poorly and they fired the coach, what's the first thing that coach does? Takes the players back to fundamentals. Here's how you block. Oh, Here's how you juke and jive. Here's how you catch a ball, right? Quarterbacks, here's feet placement. They start with fundamentals. And so if we get to the place where we are living in love, forgiving with grace and mercy, and we get proud, we're going to get taken down. But if we come to the end of that and we go, you know what? 
I'm going to go work on my fundamentals. Mm -hmm. Then we continue to build ourselves so that the next iteration of this in our life is more and more looking like Jesus. That is the solution. As the Anabaptist Hans Denk said, to know Christ, oh, I'm sorry, only those who know Christ follow him, and only those who follow Christ know him. You cannot know Jesus until you are practicing what he practiced. You cannot know Jesus until you've walked the road that he's leading you on. Okay? Can you please say that again? That is so profound and so concise. Please say that again. I don't know. It's on tape. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but Hans Denk, only those who know Christ follow him, and only those who follow Christ know him. It's not either or. No, it's not either or. Knowledge, Christian knowledge, is not doctrinal. Christian knowledge is all relational. Come on. When I am learning to deal with your alcoholism or uh, your abusive tendencies or your constant lateness or anything, 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 when I am learning to deal with all of this with grace, compassion, mercy, generosity, and forgiveness, I am following Jesus and I will know him. I will see the world through his eyes, which are the Father's eyes, which are the eyes of the Spirit. But if I don't follow him, and I instead say, I'm just going to go to church and whatever the pastor tells me to do, I'm going to do, I'm not following Jesus, I'm following the pastor. Now if the pastor is following Jesus, that pastor, his life or her life, is going to look like Jesus in the way they relate. And if a person doesn't look like Jesus, then it's not Jesus they're worshiping. So I ask, my, I ask myself, I look at, a, at evangelicalism, I look at a progressive Christianity, I look at the Anabaptists, I look at Protestantism in general, and I ask myself, phenomenologically, that is when I'm looking at the way the church behaves, do I see Jesus? I think, no. Not at all. The church believes in superstars. Look at Hillsong. Great, huge, big, giant ministry built upon superstars. But Jesus Christ was not a superstar. Great play. Love the music. Still sing it, but he was not a superstar. Jesus wasn't successful by any stretch of the imagination. He was a, a failure. Why, he wouldn't even defend himself. He was a whip and a weakling. And that's because what the world doesn't want to recognize is this. We say God is a God of power and might. But the reality is, God who makes the heavens and the earth is powerless. When God in the beginning creates, the first thing God does is turn the creation over to the human. I am giving up power over this creation thing. This is yours. That's your garden. You tend it. It's not mine. And on the cross, we see the ultimate display of powerlessness and the greatest display of love. Because love is never about power. Love is about giving up power so that the other may live. And that is the gospel. Amen. Amen. You can kill it.